So I'm going to be beginning with a description of, uh, you know, overall, like, you know, what's the digital twin about? Uh, how are we going about uh, creating these digital twins uh, for patients? And then Griffin's going to go into some real deep stuff, right, about um, one of the main things that we're going to need, which is high quality. So, um, so here was my beginnings, right? Um, and just emphasizing that uh, with this digital representation of the patient, we can find patients for clinical trials, uh, do chart review for study simulations. And that really goes pretty far, I should say, because the study simulations that you can do, um, if you think about the kinds of data that you can extract using things what Zach was just talking about with large language models and so forth, you can go to very specific questions and we're going to look at that. Mm -hmm. And then circling back to the patient so they can find health opportunities about them, right? So it actually almost becomes an agent for the patient. So there's many different concepts that you can embody in a, in a digital twin and many different parts of medicine can take advantage of, you know, molecular, i.e. genomics, um, cellular interactions, tissue, organs, systems level, you know, designs. We're really talking at the level of the patient and the population. And so we're going to really be thinking through this use case where we could actually um, have a digital twin allow multiple conditions of the patient to be computed and actually perhaps even be simulated in a population study. So with the creation of these digital twins, we actually can then kind of put the whole thing through a true simulation. And you can imagine how helpful that would have been during COVID, right? When we were um, faced with, you know, how is, how is this disease getting so out of hand? And it turns out there was actually a missing element, right? Which the, the CDC assured us, right? That no, only people who you know, have symptoms are gonna, but that wasn't actually true, right? The problem was a lot of people who had COVID were not um, symptomatic. And, they, and, and a simulation could have shown that that was what was happening, right? Because it would have shown there was a missing element there. And that's why you know, the numbers kept going up even though we were all isolated in our houses. And so these kinds of digital twin simulations for population studies have tremendous potential. But of all things, we must make sure that our digital twins are of high quality. That's the number one thing, right? Because as Zach showed you, uh, you know, things like large language models get it right most of the time. That's not really going to work if we're going to use this, you know, for research grade results, um, and certainly not in clinical care, and we don't want to expose these, any inaccuracies to the patient. So we're only going to be able to use data and create twins when there's enough of it, right? So we need, so a lot of our focus is around how is it that we can assure ourselves that there seems to be enough data to actually create a digital twin so we don't only know what they have, but we also know what they have not. And that's going to uh, be the main topic of uh, Jeff Klan. I'll get into that in a little bit. And then um, how do we actually determine medical conditions through computed phenotypes, right, when raw data is insufficient? Now, sometimes raw data is sufficient, right? You've got an, M you've got an MRI and it shows, you know, there's some mass there. Okay, fine. But a lot of our data is in text and it's very ambiguous text and there's codes that are wrong about 50% of the time. I think I've told this story many times, but if you go in and find a, all the patients that are coded for diabetes, do you know what the chance is that the patient actually has diabetes? 50%, 50%. So, um, and then uh, we want medical conditions that are supported by descriptions in the chart, patient reported outcomes, patient reported outcomes, and or other kinds of documentation like direct telemetry, genomics, metabolomics, i.e. labs, and imaging, for example. Now, I'm going to start to introduce this kind of quantitative depiction of, you know, the kind of quality we want 
in the digital twin. And I'm going to think about along some very primitive uh, axes or dimensions of patient data that are available. So on the x-axis, we have more data that's available on patients. And on the y-axis, sorry, on the y-axis, we have, I always used to get those mixed up in school, by the way. You can see that that would cause a lot of problems if you were taking a test. OK, so um, the y-axis shows that uh, maybe we can fix that with a large language model. Um, uh, on the y-axis, we have more overall data available on our patients. And on the x-axis, there's more codes right, that are actually specific for a condition described. And so you're going to have um, uh, a certain situation where you want to make sure that you have a cohort of patients that you're creating digital twins for who have a smattering of data about lots of different things in the chart, right? It's not just a visit because, you know, they had a problem with their right eye and it turned out that, you know, it was uh, uh, that they had a uh, something in the eye or something. Do we need something where, you know, patients have been followed for a long time. They've had, you know, lots of different opportunities to interact with clinicians who can really get a good broad uh, assessment of, you know, who the patient is, what kinds of things they have, and, um, and, and, and tests that, that, that are very important to diagnose some of these things. And so we have this idea that we need a loyalty cohort, right? and um, that there's enough data available on the patient. And so in that way, all the patients who don't have enough overall data are not going to be candidates to be a digital twin because we're just not going to know enough about them. Now, the second is, even if we do have a lot of data on them, right, a lot of that data might be incorrect, as in, our diabetes example, right, where even though they have codes for diabetes, it's, um, they're incorrect. And in fact, um, you have to give a patient a code for diabetes if you get a glucose tolerance test, which is a test to see if they have diabetes. So you can see where a lot of this coding error arises. Now, the bottom line is the way that we determine, in many cases, um, if a patient really has a disease, is we count the features that they have in the chart, right? Either, you know, something like fee codes, which we do here, which is able to actually uh, help separate patients into, does a patient have lots of codes or not for diabetes? Now, even if they have, let's say one patient has three codes and another patient has three codes for diabetes, you might say, well, then what's the threshold? Three, but the bottom line is, if the one patient has three codes and diabetes out of 10,000 visits, right, and you think of each visit as an opportunity to get a randomly assigned incorrect code, that's going to have a lot of chance for noise. While the other patient might have, let's say, 100 visits, and they have three codes for diabetes, so they're going to have less random chance. So this is kind of a difficult thing to translate, and I always have trouble with it, so I like to keep going with my graph now. And think of this as, and actually, by the way, this isn't even my graph, this is Griffin's graph. But I, I thought it was so good <laughs> that I was going to use it for my, for, for my talk. So anyway, all right. But the bottom line is that um, these are conditions that are eliminated because there is not enough data. So you see, and you see this funny angle on it, that's because they have more and more codes, even though they might have more and more codes for a condition, if they have more overall data, the chance that one of those codes is randomly assigned incorrectly increases, actually, as they get more and more data collected on them. So therefore, you need this kind of wedged shape for that um, uh, depiction. And then finally, we want to be able to confirm, actually look these things up and say, where is it in the data that these things exist? And we're going to go into this at great length when um, Mike and Chris and I and Nikolai, is Nikolai here? Not yet. Okay. Are going to uh, discuss large language models at the end of Friday, basically. But the bottom line is that because of the way that embeddings can capture the meanings of charts, you can actually take a chart or hundreds of charts on a patient, right? 
hundreds of notes on a patient, and you can strip out and query it for those parts of the chart that seem to describe what it is that you think that patient's condition is. And then you can take all those pieces, put those into the large language model, and say, do these pieces really support that this patient has diabetes? And out it will come yes or no, basically, but not just yes or no. It will actually point back to where in the chart it said the large language model determined yes or no, right? And this has actually been done. So here's a paper that was published by, or not published yet, I think it's in the process, but you can look it up on MedXRV. And Emily Alsenzer, a student of uh, Pete Solovitz's, by the way, who now works with David Bates at Mass General Brigham, is, uh, has done this, right? And she actually went further. She didn't just look for one condition. She looked for specific uh, things about a condition, even, about a condition. So they could actually kind of do a simulated clinical trial on uh, postpartum hemorrhage in this case. So they can get to some real detailed conditions, not just, um, uh, you know, things that are defined in ICD-10 codes. And this kind of thing has also been done by Victor and Nitch and the Recover team, where we look at extracting from patient reported outcomes, how is it that we can actually get conditions um, from the EHR that simulate what we, what, what we collect in a trial like uh, Recover. And, um, So now, getting back to our graph, we're only going to hold on to things, to those conditions that are um, supported by evidence in the chart, right? So they have to be enough data on the patient. Computed phenotypes have to show those to be true, high quality renditions of what conditions are in the patient and supported by what's in the chart. And that's our high quality digital twin. And that's it. Now, another way to think about a digital twin is it's kind of a big list of um, conditions that we think are there in the twin, both, you know, study specific conditions, conditions maybe, you know, you're specifically interested in and you're going to do your analysis for, and core conditions that, you know, are part of a repertoire of um, computed phenotypes. And that, um, this kind of computation is going to be rendered in something uh, which looks like this, um, which uh, David Wang, uh, Hee Kyung Park, uh, Nich Wadanathan, and Vivian uh, Gaynor have been working on that allow us to actually not only uh, see what conditions patients have, those are the dark ones, but what conditions they don't have, but that we looked for, right? Because if you don't know what they don't have, but we looked for, you might not know, well, you know, did they even look for something? And if they, so, so this is, is very careful to make um, that distinction. And it can point back to the places, as you can see over on the left, where those um, conditions are, are annotated. Now, again, this is being hosted in a technical platform, right? And there's a lot of work that has to go behind this. And so the idea that, you know, you need to keep this in a enclave is important. And a lot of the work that we're talking about really would have to occur probably in some kind of an enclave if we're gonna use these notes and so forth. Because the, once the, the, the digital twin model is released, it's not a de-identified digital twin, right? It's the digital twin of the patient. And so that it's gonna have enough information that it's very likely that you could figure out, even if you don't have the name, which is, might even be hard to extract, right, after you've done all that work, even if you don't have the name of the patient, you could have, a, you've got a lot of profiling. So the building of this in, into an, in, in an enclave is going to be an important kind of concept that I think, you know, we, we would have to um, embody. Now, fortunately, the I2B2 query and visualization tool, as you know, kind of de-identifies the data when it does a query on the fly, right? It obfuscates the data. So we can still use our I2B2 tools to work with the data because when it accesses the data, even though the data might be identified underneath, it creates an obfuscated set, which um, you can't go back and figure out who the individual patients are. So let's think about 
finally, what the, and this is our courtesy of uh, Jeff Kinkle, by the way, the current state of affairs in, 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 in um, human intelligence and artificial intelligence. And I'll say, so the conditions, you know, of, of, of being able to learn and think and remember and uh, attend, decide and so forth um, are, are, are things that, um, you know, we've been uh, blessed with for a long time. And then we think of ourselves of having executive functioning and critical thinking and abstract thinking and creativity, right? Now, you know, we now know that artificial intelligence, of course, can learn, remember, attend, decide, but it seems like it also is starting to make headways on things that we didn't really think about it, you know, it doing, uh, building on knowledge, generalizing reasoning and thinking. And the fact is that um, this is making these kinds of digital replicas more and more um, uh, human-like in a way, such that they might become actual agents for us, you know, to seek out, you know, things that clinical trials and so forth that we might actually like to be part of, um, you know, independently of us then having to, you know, go and, you know, seek all this out for ourselves. So this is, um, the development of these twins is something that I think we can really hold on to in that, in that way. All right, so now Griffin, who is uh, really behind some of the real uh, uh, work that we hope to release uh, in the spring, um, is going to talk about um, developing computed phenotypes for the digital twin.